Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we offer thought leadership for wholesale change agents like you. Because if you have joined us on this show, you probably are a wholesale change agent. My name's Ian Heller. I'll be your co-host today, along with my business partner. He's the ace of analytics. He's the doctor of distribution. Jonathan Bine, PhD. Jonathan, how are you today, my friend? Only from A to D, not from A to Z. <laughs> you know, I, I, I try to think of a new one every week. I don't always succeed. I think I've used A's of analytics it, it, before. It, it's tough coming up with good things to say about me. I get it. I get it. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. Is, is, as Ernie Banks used to say, the great Cub, it's a beautiful day for a ball game. Let's play two. <laughs> great. Well, welcome. We've got a great show today. We're going to bring in our special guest here in a few minutes. We're very excited about this conversation. Uh, but first, I want to thank Epicor, our sponsor, without whom this show would not be possible. Are you finally ready to integrate all your business functions with an enterprise resource planning system, or maybe you're struggling with legacy computer systems that just aren't cutting it anymore. Your IT costs seem never ending. Your servers are at the end of their lifespan. Your systems don't talk to each other and you can't get decent reporting to make informed decisions. Does this sound like you? At Epicor, they get you and your unique distribution challenges. Epicor has been around for 50 years. Their ERP solutions were designed with distributors for distributors like you. Epicor for distribution goes beyond standard ERPs to provide innovative, highly focused solutions that are made for and essential to your business. Learn more about how Epicor has helped thousands of wholesalers succeed by visiting epicor.com slash distribution. So thanks again to Epicor for making this content possible today. Also, thanks to our many, many podcast listeners. I know you can't, uh, you, you you can't submit questions, and that's one of the benefits of being on the show live, but we do appreciate our very large podcast audience uh, who consumes this content as well. But now I'd like to bring in our guest. We're very, very happy and pleased and excited to talk to Kevin Wadick. Kevin is the president of Zorro US. Kevin, welcome to the Wholesale Chain Show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Great. Well, I had the honor of uh, being on stage with you at the National Association of Wholesaler Distributors Conference back in January. And we wanted that to be kind of a fireside chat, but we ran out of time. So I really appreciate you agreeing to continue the discussion here. I know we, we have sort of a geographically uh, diversified uh, set of locations today because you are obviously in downtown Chicago, can tell by your background. I know Jonathan's in Boulder, it's probably high. And I'm in uh, Dallas, Texas, in a hotel room, getting ready to go to a meeting later on today. So it's nice that we can all come together virtually. You're probably, so, uh, not, Kevin, you're probably not high. No, I'm not actually. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's it's only 11 here, so you know, <laughs> the day is early. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, uh, Kevin, I've got your uh, resume up for our webcast listeners or our viewers. I was wondering, could you kind of just sort of go through your educational and uh, career background before we jump into the questions? Sure. Um, so I'm a, a two-time Badger. Uh, went to the University of Wisconsin. Um, arrived right around when Barry Alvarez arrived. So so got to actually experience the first taste of football success that the Badgers had when I was uh, an undergrad. So that was a lot of fun. I'm um, kind of in between uh, my undergrad and uh, graduate school. Um, I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers. So I'm a recovering CPA. Um, <laughs> I, I had a lot more interest in supply chain. So I actually, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, there is the Granger Center for Supply Chain Management. Um, and so I went to that program. Um, I didn't really know that much about Granger before going to that program. And then uh, upon completing my MBA, was fortunate to, to get an opportunity to join the team at Granger. Um, and so I've worked in the Granger family of businesses in the US, um, in um, Canada, in Europe, and now back in the U.S. with Zorro um, for almost 20 years, um, and I've gotten to touch a lot of different functional areas, uh, which I think has been really helpful to to giving me the context that I needed to to essentially have the opportunity to lead Zorro. Yeah. So for our podcast listeners, Kevin's been in senior executive roles in supply chain, inventory management, product management, uh, marketing. Uh, etc. and uh, now runs the uh, marketplace Zorro US. So um, 
So a couple thoughts. One is that you were in supply chain before supply chain was sexy, right? Now everybody talks about it. Uh, in fact, I told Jonathan this, that I was walking into a Whole Foods store near my house a couple of weeks ago, and there were, were some Girl Scouts and their moms selling cookies. As so I walked up to the table and I said, uh, do you have any gluten-free cookies? And one of the moms shook her head and she said, no, we've been, they're back order. We've been having supply chain issues. I thought, wow, the Girl Scouts were talking about supply chain issues. My son said that's an opportunity for a new merit badge for them. But um, yeah. so, so what are your, I mean, we have a lot of people on this show who want to be in a job like yours someday, Kevin. So, you know, when you're coaching other executives, you know, maybe they work for you or you coach them through, through some other channel. What's some of the advice you give them about, you know, how to achieve a, the, the high levels of uh, success that you've earned in uh, distribution? Well, um, so, so Ian, when I, when I kind of think about it, the, the first thing is I was probably focused a lot more on going across the organization than trying to immediately go up. Um, mm -hmm. So I really wanted to collect a bunch of different experiences in different parts of the business. Um, you know, I obviously was really interested in supply chain. And so you know, starting in the supply chain and being in distribution operations, inventory management, other areas helped me get a lot of um, context for a distributor, you know, because effectively that's what we are, we're a supply chain. Um, and, and so, but just really being open to moving across the organization and collecting those experiences, because I think it helped me get context um, and put pieces of the puzzle together. And then the other, you can see that I've kind of lived in a variety of different geographies. So just this willingness to kind of take risks, um, you know, uh, and figuring out how to sell my wife on, hey, we're going to move to Canada. Hey, do you want to move to Europe? Hey, we live in Europe. Do you want to move to England? And so, so it was one of those things where, one, I had a really supportive, um, you know, family situation, but we took a, we took a whole bunch of, you know, risks where things weren't always certain of exactly what the next role would be or how it would work out. And, but all those things kind of led to, to some fortunate timing and the, the Zorro opportunity being available. And now I feel like I have one of the, the best jobs in the organization, so. Yeah, no, that's really exciting. And you've been there since 2017 as, as the president the whole time, right? Yes, yep. Good, okay. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, let's start uh, having a discussion about the topic of the show, which is how uh, distributors can you know, succeed on third-party marketplaces. Uh, but I did have a friend of mine text me a question this morning uh, before the show. He's on an airplane, so he can't join live. Uh, but his question is, why didn't Granger just become a marketplace rather than starting a separate division in Zorro as a marketplace? So, so I think part of that goes back to, you know, in the, the late 90s, Granger made an equity investment in a, a business called Monotaro in Japan. Um, and... Um, so one, I don't think we see Zorro exactly as a marketplace. We can get into that in a little bit, but, but Monotaro was a business that was pursuing the, an endless assortment strategy and was having a lot of success with um, particularly small businesses that were underserved. Um, and, and so um, Granger has always been really successful at serving um, customers with you know, more complex uh, needs, whether that's around inventory management solutions or, you know, how, how you can take cost out of procurement processes. And I think they saw an opportunity to create a complementary business in the U.S. that would allow them to be really relevant to small businesses where it's probably harder to put uh, sales coverage in place and really talk about and deliver on the value that, that Granger gives every day to its um, kind of large and mid-sized customers. And so really felt more like a, a market opportunity. And they had this uh, analog in Japan that was, you know, has grown pretty much every year since inception over 20% per year is now, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, over 1.5 billion in revenue. And so, so they had this opportunity that they saw. And, and so Zoro really kind of was birthed from that. Maybe, so what, maybe, go ahead, Jonathan. Through, maybe take us through what Zoro is and what it does. Uh, in the marketplace. Yep. So, so our, our goal is to help um, small businesses find by and get all the things they need to, to do their job and, and get on with their day. Um, and, and so the three value things that, that we hear a lot from our customer base is I want a vast assortment. 
Um, I want fair pricing and I want to be able to get delivery quickly. So what Zorro has done, it initially started by merchandising Granger's assortment into the market. Um, and then we started expanding that assortment um, to other uh, categories of products that Granger doesn't serve. Um, and you know, so, so then what we did is we started initially with um, reaching out to Granger's supply base, so primarily OEMs, but most OEMs are not actually designed to serve you know, small business customer needs because they don't want to ship eaches, they want to ship pallets. Um, and so what we've really done to expand our assortment to address those customer needs is build partnerships with other distributors. Um, and we serve essentially as a way for other distributors to reach customers that they're unlikely to engage with. Um, because we primarily go to market through digital channels. Um, that's something that we're, we're pretty good at. And so that allows us to, to serve customers that are starting their purchasing journey online. Um, and then we use that assortment to introduce ourselves to customers. Um, and then we use that assortment later to further engage with customers and help them understand all the ways that we can help them find what they need uh, quickly and easily. So, so other like building really uh, you know strong partnerships with distributors is very helpful for us. So so we're different than a marketplace in that you can't just list on Zorro. We build a commercial relationship with our partners. We don't have any physical um, distribution ourselves, so we rely on those partners to to help us serve customers. So we really um, are the customer facing piece, um, and then we rely on our partners to provide more of the supply chain and logistics support. So when you say reach customers that they would not ordinarily reach, mm -hmm. do you mean it's because they're digital or is it because it's a low, smaller end of the market that is in, that is expensive for distributors to reach? Say more about what you mean by customers they wouldn't normally reach. Sure, so so I think it's, it's a bit of both. So when most um, distributors, like a customer has to have a certain amount of scale in order to be able to put, uh, you know, kind of a, a sales representative, whether it's inside or outside, um, in front of that customer. Um, some distributors might also have like certain geographic reach. And so by us essentially taking those products and merchandising them in a variety of digital channels designed to create um, awareness for customers that are searching for certain product needs, that's how we introduce ourselves. Um, it's not necessarily easy for a distributor to immediately jump into um, where customers are looking online and have themselves be surfaced as an opportunity. So, so we find that um, we're very complementary to our partners. We tend to not um, compete with our partners because we're just going about reaching customers in very different ways. So uh, in, that, in that regard, there's a relevant question here, uh, Kevin. How do you see Zorro competing against Amazon business? And as part of that, how do you differentiate Zorro from Amazon business? So, um, so a couple of ways. So, so one, they are um, uh, you know, our largest competitor, um, but they aren't our only competitor. Um, we, we, we have a pretty vast competitive set um, and it really is you know, anyone that um, has, has taken the time and effort to think about how they want to merchandise products in different digital channels. But Amazon is certainly, you know, a, a significant player when it comes to how we acquire, acquire customers and who we compete against. Um, I, I think the areas that we think we can create a lot of opportunity are, one, um, we really have a partnership with the distributors um, and so we value that partnership. And so we don't have any inventory position or warehousing. So we're not looking to compete with them from a, uh, a standpoint of um, learning about what assortment sells and then taking an inventory position. You know, there's no, there's no risk of disintermediation with Zorro. And so what we find is that gives us access to products and brands that might not exist on Amazon um, business, where there are a number of brands that see that um, as not always the best place for them to list their assortment. Um, and so, so that gives us access to the types of products that customers need. Um, so, so that helps us create value. Um, Amazon is a very large advertising platform as well. Um, and we focus our customer experience from say a search standpoint on how we create relevance. Um, and so in other words, our focus is if a customer is looking for a specific product in a specific brand, we should surface those things to them. And so we don't 
um, we don't look to to essentially sell advertising um, on our platform. Instead, what we're trying to do is is be really relevant to the customer in terms of surfacing the things that they're looking for, so that we make it easy for them to find what they need. And then by leveraging distribution partners who are really good at um, pick pack ship. Um, you know, that gives us the ability to get products to customers quickly, which is one of the things that they really value. So, yeah. So, uh, here's a really easy question. I want to follow up with a comment. So the easy question, which I think you've pretty much addressed already is, will Zorro, uh, ever introduce private label products like other competitors, obviously like Amazon. Mm -hmm. So, so we will merchandise our distributors private label if they're interested in us doing that. And, and I would say there's two kinds of ways that that looks. So we have access to some of our partners' actual private labels because they want to create scale against those brands. And right. so they're interested in, in us merchandising them. Um, or we might merchandise our, our distributors' private labels as non-branded under what we call Zorro Select. And that might be an example of something that comes in a clear bag um, that doesn't have any branding on it. You know, right. a tarp, for example. So, so, but that's always with the permission of our partners. We aren't creating any um, sourcing operation or private label on our own. Got it. So, let me offer a couple of things since I study marketplaces a lot. One is that any marketplace that is also itself a merchant has inherent risk that a company like Zorro does not for its third party sellers. Because if you're selling through, walmart.com or you're selling through Amazon or Amazon business, those are companies that have their own distribution centers. They have uh, category managers. They have relationships with manufacturers. They have already their own private label programs. And so whatever their reassurance is, they have the competencies, the capabilities to analyze third-party data, data and introduce their own SKUs to compete with those sellers. Zorro does not. In that regard, you're much more like an eBay, which does not have its own warehouses and merchants and mm -hmm. transportation networks, et cetera. So when I talk to distributors about risk, one of the reasons I suggest they talk to Zorro, and this is no commercial, you guys don't aren't paying to mm -hmm. be on the show, and we're not paying you, right? This is a this is a journalism, not not advertorial. But one of the reasons I suggest to distributors that they talk to Zorro is because you clearly uh, don't have the capabilities. Uh, to create these private label products because you can't warehouse them, buy them, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, when we've done research, Kevin, and asked distributors, uh, which is the most common, what are the most common marketplaces that the distributors in our audience sell on? Zorro is actually number one. Which is great for, for us. I think what it shows is that that we're starting to create, I think, a really interesting and compelling supplier brand that helps our distribution partners understand, you know, where Zorro can help them get incremental, you know, profitable scale um, that helps them um, continue to focus on serving their customers, but also, you know, di distribution is a game where scale is really helpful, um, you know. The more you sell of a given item, the better the better service levels you can provide. Um, you know, the better uh, you know, kind of buying position you are. And so if we're giving them supply chain scale, it just helps them compete in other facets of their business too. So we find it to be a, a really healthy relationship for, for both partners. I think the key word that you mentioned as you started to describe it is relevance versus advertising. I mean, it really is presenting the products that are relevant to the customer as opposed to relevant to the operator of the marketplace or relevant to the suppliers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in being relevant to the customer, you end up being fairer to the suppliers. Your, your whole approach with how you use their private label instead of creating your own, instead of cherry picking, um, is also a better game or better win for the suppliers. Yeah, I think, I think you know, since we don't have any distribution capacity of our own um, and we have no intent to really you know, play in that space, um, if we start behaving in ways that that are destructive to our distribution partners, then we lose access to the assortment that our customers need. And that then Zorro isn't very compelling for the customer base, which ultimately is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help small businesses find what they need, 
you know, it's often very hard to, even in this space, you know, even with great things like, you know, Google and Bing and things like that, it's often hard to figure out exactly what it is you need and who has it and what's the price. And so if Zorro can serve that niche for customers, I, I think that really helps us uh, be an attractive partner for distributors. Got a number of questions lined up, Ian. Do we want to take a couple of these now? Yeah, why don't we... Uh... Why don't we why don't we make sure we we get these inserted? So, um, one question uh, is: Will Zorro also act as a three PL and stock vendor SKUs and ship them on behalf of sellers? We've already covered that. You just don't do that, right? No, nope, not something that we do. Okay. Uh, another one is: uh, From a go to market perspective, Zorro often seems to have very aggressive pricing strategies, even compared to Amazon. Uh, isn't this dilutive to Zorro and its partners? And to what extent can Zorro partners influence go to market pricing, et cetera? Yep, I think that's a fair question. So here's what I'd say. Our, our intent is never to set the market for a price. Our intent is to um, be in the, con the consideration set. So a lot of our traffic um, when we're introducing ourselves to new customers comes from um, search engines like Google and Bing. Um, you know, if you type a, a brand and a part number into one of those search engines, you're going to get lots of options that you can buy from, and it's pretty transparent what the price you should pay is in those situations. So we really have to, to have a price that allows us to be competitive. Um, but, but again, we're not looking to ever set the market, um, you know, for the price of the item. And so, so, so we, we do see, um, our pricing often being comparable to Amazon, but often it's comparable to Amazon and many other um, partners that, that are selling those products online, so. Got it. Um, here's another one. I believe you're selling direct from manufacturers also, which by the way, is true of every marketplace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there potential conflict representing manufacturers and their distributors as well? So. So I would say we do it, but, but a really good example would be like Cotterman ladders. So rolling ladders, um, that's an example of where we're selling directly from a manufacturer, but it's very common for um, everybody to distribute those products. No one really carries them in stock um, and they have a strong distribution network. Um, so they have a lot of partnerships with distributors. And so you're taking the order and you're, you're sending it to them to fulfill. Um, and it, it just makes economic sense for them to fulfill it, given the size of the product, the risk of damage and transit and things like that. So most of our manufacturer direct shipments look like those types of things. Maybe it's, you know, generators, um, you know, um, and those types of things, or maybe it's, it's make to order specials. So the overwhelming majority of our actual items that we merchandise and the transactions that we have actually are fulfilled directly from our distribution partners versus manufacturers. And usually we do it more as it's, it's the normal route to market for that product, um, you know, and that product family. Uh, before we jump to the next question, Kevin, um, you guys recently published your numbers from last year. Can you share what you're willing to share publicly or able to share publicly about the size of the company? Sure. So, um, so Zorro has about eight and a half million items um, that we merchandise online. Uh, when I joined the business in 2017, it was about one and a half million. So we've added about seven million items through our partnerships. Um, we've grown from over, you know, 400 million when I joined to just over 850 million last year wow. um, with, with kind of, you know, profitability improving and at about four and a half percent of sales. So, so it's been fun. Yeah. That's a, that's a terrific run. Uh, the, the rally should continue for you. Um, so question is, if you are a traditional wholesale distributor and looking to build marketplace capability and recruiting sellers to sell within your first party website, yep. how do you recommend building the organization structure to support this? Is this incubated within a, tradition, within a business development group, traditional category management within digital marketing? It's obviously very, very sophisticated uh, thinker behind this question. Yes. So, so what I would say is there's a few things. So if you want to be a pure marketplace, I think the things that you need to consider are how are you going to control like who lists on your platform? Um, so, so that would be, you know, a, a really important um, question for you to consider. 
Um, do you want to be open? Do you want to be closed? How are you going to vet what products they list? How are you going to make sure that, you know, you stand behind all the things that that those um, third parties you know, place on your platform? Um, that would be one. How are you going to manage all the product information and create a discovery experience on your platform so that customers can actually find what they're looking for? Are you going to want multiple listings per item? Are you going to have a single listing per item? Right? eBay is more multiple listings. Um, you know, Amazon and Walmart are more consolidated listings. So, so the product information challenges are, are not trivial. Um, and then how are you going to drive traffic to your property? So how are you actually, if you want to be a marketplace, um, you know, what's your value to the customers? How are you going to introduce yourselves to customers? How are you going to get customers to your platform? So, so what's your marketing strategy for doing that? And, um, you know, and it's, it's not, um, it's not an easy thing necessarily to, to, to do, um, and particularly to do at scale. So if you're going to, if you're going to engage in search engine marketing, how are you going to think about that across, you know, hundreds of thousands to, to millions of items? Like, how are you going to manage the data associated with it? And so I think those are all the kinds of questions that one would, would ask. And I contrast that to a distributor that just wants to offer expanded assortment. And I think, you know, a, a way to think about that is probably more through a traditional category lens. You know, do you, is it something your customers need? You know, can you create relevance for your customers and, and approach them um, and, and kind of add those products on? So, so I think it just depends on what the distributor's orientation is. Um, we've got another question, which is since you rely heavily on your partners, how do you ensure customers are consistently satisfied with their overall experience end to end? That's a good question. Yeah. It's, it's really a QA question, right? Yep. Right. yep. So, so we obviously, when we sign up partners, we're, we, we have some things that are really important. Um, and so, you know, our, our category management and business development teams help those um, partners understand what our expectations are around timeliness of shipping, what we want the, the packing slips to look like in terms of information. So it eases the customer with the, the identification that the, hey, this is what I bought from Zorro. Um, we look to, to make sure that we do test orders to make sure everything flows um, in, a, uh, in a way where they're passing us the information that yes, they've in fact received the order and yes, they've in fact shipped the order and yes, here's the tracking information associated with the order. So we can confirm for the customer that the product's been shipped. And then obviously we monitor those things just like anyone, you know, kind of monitors their supplier performance and, and essentially have ongoing dialogues about, you know, how things are going, you know, where people are meeting expectations, where they may not be, how we might be able to help them be more successful. Um, so, so, you know, more of what I would just describe as like pretty, pretty common supplier performance management that people do. But there's a lot of data that exchanges between us and the partner. And we, we try and make sure we, we do a really nice job of helping them onboard to our platform. We need to make it easy for them to, to want to do business with us. Got it. So, um, Kevin, there's a question here and I want to read it to you and then sort of expand on it just a little bit, add something to it. So the person's asking, is the goal to replace distributors' websites and drive customers to Zorro's website or to complement distributors' websites? And if it's to replace them, how does the distributor's brand continue to thrive on the Zorro mm -hmm. marketplace? And, and let me just add to that one, one, one mm -hmm. point before you, you address it, which is that I think this whole notion of either or is going out of date. I think mm -hmm. there are, you know, distributors are going to sell some stuff online. They need to participate in some marketplaces, in my view, at least many distributors do. Um, and the old fashioned view of a website reflects one company, one set of SKUs, one set of suppliers, and that's my one channel to market. That's just old fashioned thinking now. And, you know, as so as distributors evaluate selling on Zorro or doing their own e-commerce, that's not an either or decision anymore. I guess it's my, my addition to that question. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I, I would totally agree with you, Ian. So, so what I'd say is we're not actually trying to replace any distributors e-commerce um, presence. You know, if you look at our parent company, they have a really well-established e-commerce presence. And you know, most of the items that they sell, you'll find on Zorro.com. 
Um, and what we find, you know, maybe the best way to describe this is Google gives some really interesting information to its marketers, um, you know, which is impression overlap. So that tells you how often your advertisement overlaps with your competitors' advertisements. Our impression and overlap with Granger is very, very low. Um, our impression overlap with, say, Amazon, very, very high, right? And so it's because we're really, I think, going after different types of customers. A lot of, you know, what Granger does and what, what some of its other, you know, distributors or other, you know, distributors like Motion and Graybar and in kind of other verticals do really, really well is serve their customers that have requirements that, that Zorro is probably not well positioned to actually serve. And that's what most distributors do um, is they create lots of value for their customers. We're, we're more, I would say, oriented to the, the purchaser that is just, they, they generally know what they need or, or have a pretty good inclining of what they need and they want a simple and efficient transaction. And they're probably, they're not reaching out to a salesperson for technical support. They don't need a lot of value wrapped around the transaction. And so that's where we tend to do really well is when someone need that, that just an easy transaction. Yeah, I, we've talked about this before, but we have something called the distributor relative, relative value model. And I think you guys have, think about your business in, in a way that is somewhat consistent with how we've characterized it, which is that if it's pure e-commerce and there aren't a lot of services involved, then things like very, very broad assortment and fast delivery are really going to, going to carry the day in terms of meeting customers' needs. Yep. And helping those customers understand like all the ways that we can help them is, is that's kind of the big unlock for us is We've, we've, we've gotten the first transaction. How do we help those customers now understand, hey, you, you bought like a, a power drill from us. Right. You know, here's all the accessories that you could buy with that. Hey, here's all your hand tool needs that we could support. Oh, your electrical needs. So, so it's understanding that business and then being able to take this really big assortment and try and make it relevant for them. Okay, good. And so we have a question here. I'm not sure if you're gonna wanna answer this. So I'll run it by right. you don't, no obligation. Uh, someone's asking uh, when you're four percent uh he's calling it return on sales i guess that's four percent is that, yep. is that uh, okay did you capitalize your customer acquisition costs so no um okay. no so so advertising costs you know gap just expensed as incurred so all right so that so that is comparable to how other distributors or other yep. sellers would measure return on sales mm -hmm. okay yeah great. that's our gap operating earnings that um we're part of a reportable segment within granger and so that's what we disclosed back in january when when granger reported their earnings right right um so um boy we have a lot of questions uh how will Zorro offer services to differentiate from competitors? You know, are there things like, you know, custom cut products, custom made products, in-store pickup at other locations? Uh, do you see any services or offerings as something Zorro would do in the future? Again, if you don't want to reveal competitive information, you don't have to ask it but or answer it, but that's the question. Yeah, so... So what I would say is there's a lot of things that we've thought about and, and in the future will likely do. I would say that the number one challenge that customers tell us is help us find our stuff, help us find our stuff. And so a lot of our effort is focused on how do we make sure that we keep improving the navigation experience on Zorro. One of the big challenges, right, that, that anyone with a really vast assortment has is how do I, how do I take, you know, some words that someone typed into a bar and and convert that into something that's meaningful that helps the customer feel like they're making progress to find what they need. And so most of our focus in the near term is really continuing to improve our ability to help customers navigate to the things that they need. Yeah, you've mentioned search a couple of times. And uh, one of the, I guess my hypothesis is that Amazon is no longer Earth's most customer centric company because they have substituted an advertising priority over a, or they prioritized advertising over search. So if I, was, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who told me that when she needs to buy something or when she wants to buy something on Amazon, she actually Googles it first so she can find the exact description term SKU and then puts it in Amazon. Otherwise she can't get past the Amazon ads. Mm -hmm. There's so much sponsored stuff in there. And you used to see a lot of 
you know, customers who bought this, bought that. There's still some of that, but now you see sponsored things that are, you know, people are paying for placement. And I think one of the advantages, I think that that creates a disadvantage for Amazon. Uh, and I think one of the advantages that you, it's an opening for Zorro, right? And that, mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're prioritizing meeting the customer's needs, that's important in retail. It's even more important in B2B because people need to be efficient and they're buying. They're not, they're never shopping recreationally. So I hope that you will tell me that you guys will continue to prioritize search to find products over advertising. Is that the case? Yeah, we don't, we don't, so we don't know, we don't have any advertising um, that like on our website. So we do have recommendation engines and things like that, but again, they're designed to try and surface things that are adjacent. So, you know, when it's like, you might also like, um, sometimes people give you search terms that are, you know, if you type in a specific part number, you're likely to go directly to the page of that part number. If you type in something where you say, I need safety gloves, that's really broad. And so how do we interpret that and, and get you on a navigation journey that helps you find what you need? So yeah, we don't, we don't have any intent to monetize the, the search experience through advertising. Okay. Um, so someone's asking about your, I don't know if you published anything about goals or you know, SKU expansion or anything else? Is there anything that you can share about what you're, what you're thinking of in terms of expanding the business? Yeah, I think what we've said is, you know, our, our goal is, you know, over the next four to five years to try and get, you know, to the 15 million product range. Um, the last couple of years, we've been um, adding, you know, two to three million items a year to the, to the platform. And so, you know, obviously that's, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, and so we've built out uh, a business development and category management team to, to try and achieve that end. Okay. Uh, now here's kind of an interesting one. Uh, and I think this is, this is a, a good one for you here. I'm trying to understand how a distributor gains advantage working with Zorro. If I'm a distributor carrying widget A, which is widely carried by distributors in my market and across the country, how do I sell widget A on Zorro are there many widget seller A listings on Zorro at the same time? So, so there are no widget A multiple listings like on Zorro. So, so um, effectively today, if we are selling a product, we are single sourcing that product from a partner. Right. Um, as we go forward, that partner might be in, you know, um, you know Pennsylvania. And so we might want to have a partner that also distributes that product in California because it gets a, it helps us get it to the customer faster. Um, and so really what we've said to our partners is that if we ever added like an additional distributor or seller of that item, the person that would win is who gives the customer the best outcome. Because the customers tell us again, vast assortment, fair pricing, speedy delivery. So, so we're really designing a partnership network that's designed to achieve that end. Um, so in, in the case of, you know, he, here, here's maybe a different example would be, we want to be able to do things like multi-sourcing because say someone's buying an electrical switch that, uh, and, and black electric tape. Um, we want to find the partner that can service both because then it's one shipment to the customer. Um, the customer has a better experience because they don't have to receive and dispose of multiple boxes. We get a more, you know, kind of environmentally efficient transfer to the customer. And so, so the reason that we would want to have multiple partners is because most of our distribution partners are, are, you know, I'd say mid-sized businesses that uh, are, are in one, maybe two kind of distribution centers as opposed to like national footprint distribution centers. So. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're saying a lot of your, your distributors are regional in scope. They are today. Okay. So um, we had another question. I think this is a really good one. Help us understand why what a distributor who competes with Granger do business with Zorro. But why a distributor that competes? Um, so I think it's different. So so here would be the the interesting one is Granger and Zorro in theory are competing, right? And and yet, if you look at both businesses, there's very healthy growth rates in both. So um, I, I guess the way I'd say it is that 
we will probably be additive to you and we are probably reaching customers that you would be unlikely to reach on your own. Um, and so we would create incrementality for that. The other thing I would say is we operate on an entirely different technology, um, you know, data warehouses and things like that. And we don't share like our customer information back with Granger. We don't share our assortment that we're building back with Granger. Um, so, you know, it, it's one of those things where the businesses run really independently. So it, it is something that we see um, people ask. Um, and I'm sure like our business development team is probably more articulate at, at talking through that than I am. But again, we, we tend to create incrementality for our partners um, and we tend to not find that we're um, competing with them from an overlap standpoint. So in practice, um, there's not actually a firewall between you, but there's effectively a firewall between you and Granger in terms of... Yeah, I, I would describe it as a firewall in the sense that it's completely different technology. Um, so when we get an order, um, we take the order, we determine who we're going to route the order to. If we route it to a partner, we route the order to the partner. Granger never sees that. And they don't get access to it through reporting or data or anything else. Nope. You know, it's funny because uh, they're... I guess it's just human nature, but we're very secretive with our data, with our traditional competitors, but then people go and sell stuff on Amazon and I can send you article after article where Amazon's been accused of looking at that third party data and, you know, competing with their, with their own sellers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my perspective is if you see a long history of that and there's a congressional investigation, uh, then, you know, Unless you're going to say, I'm never going to sell in a marketplace because I accept zero risk, uh, then, you know, you really need to talk to people who have, you know, been shown to be good as their word. And I do view that as Zorro, Kevin, based on what I've heard from other distributors. Well, thanks for that. And, and what I would say is the way that, that we think about it again is we're, we're trying to behave in a manner that is additive to our partners because without our partners, we don't get more assortment and assortment really helps us spin our growth flywheel. And so, um, so we have to create uh, like a really viable proposition for our partners in order to live up to what we want to do for our customers. And so, so we, we see that as they're giving us a lot of faith and trust. And so we need to, to behave in that way. I would say it, it, any open marketplace, one of the other things that you see is um, it's not just the marketplace itself that might be competing, but by listing on an open marketplace, uh, again, which Zorro isn't, um, right? You have to build a commercial relationship with us. Um, and so there's, I, I describe it as a vetting that goes on. There are lots of people out there selling lots of products that kind of look and feel very similar um, that, that, you know, so, so just by listing on an open marketplace, you're essentially letting a whole bunch of other producers in the world know, oh, there might be a need for this product. I'll make something similar and list it on that open marketplace too. And Zorro doesn't do that either. We have a question really about your, um, the, the quality or the nature of your product roadmap. And the question is, how do you determine what products categories you'll expand to, to get to your $15 million, 15 million SKU goal? So, so we have a very similar to, I think, what, what you would see in most distributors. We have a, a business development and category management team, um, and their focus is really in trying to understand our customer base and then trying to understand, like, if that's a small business, say it's a restaurant, we're probably not selling a lot of food to that restaurant. But what might they need? What types of products might they need? What might we not have? Um, and so they're, they're really trying to take a customer lens back um, and say, what do we think are things that small businesses might need? Which leads to, you know, an example would be um, break room supplies. We have partnerships with different food distributors. So we do sell some food products on Zorro and we've had some, you know, sales of those types of things. Um, we're probably not a primary supplier for a restaurant, um, but we might be supplying, you know, a small manufacturing site that has a, a need for break room supplies or something like that. You know, we, there's some toys on Zorro and it's like, well, why would there be toys in that? It's like, well, daycares. And so, you know, like we have a pretty broad definition of, of customers. We, we don't have a concentration in any one industry. 
Um, and so, so what we're really trying to do is understand the canvas of kind of needs for small businesses and, and really tilt our assortment and our efforts to those areas. So, so you don't say, like you mentioned break room, you don't say, you know, Jan Sand is the next hill we're going to climb and we're going to require, you know, 800,000 SKUs or. Um, so they might, they might look at it that way and they'd say, hey, Jan Sand is an area where we're seeing a lot of needs for small businesses. We should probably invest effort to understand the shape of distribution in Jansan and then who might be interesting partners for us to go um, and build relationships with, so. Nice. Um, so I had another question, which is how do, how do distributors put a toe in the water with Zorro? What are ideas about how to start relationships? But I mentioned this, this is actually a question uh, I think from our from our listeners, but I mentioned this because a lot of distributors are running experiments right now mm -hmm. beyond their own beyond their own e-commerce site. They're running experiments with different marketplaces. Obviously, Amazon. Obviously, Zorro. How would they get going with Zorro? What would that look like? So, um, I, I would suggest um, so Tracy Bilo, who I think's name is up on the screen. She leads our business development um, you know practice. So, what what you could do is you can find Tracy on LinkedIn. Um, you can reach out to Tracy directly um, and, you know, she can help you um, get in touch with, you know, the, the right um, partners. And then we're doing a lot of outreach on an ongoing basis too, where we're, you know, we have a team of folks that effectively is reaching out to other distributors in, in product families and trying to look at that. I'd say, I'd say the, the, the things we need are, you know, we need distributors that are able to give us, you know, a minimum amount of product information so we can effectively merchandise the product. Um, we need distributors that um, can um, ship relatively quickly um, so that we can provide a meaningful experience to the customer. Um, and we need, you know, people to be able to effectively like receive transactions through, you know, um, we use like an EDI portal, so they, we, we need them to be able to receive their, the transactions, you know, and give us certain messages back and things like that. But, but I'd say the, you know, usually what we're talking about is, you know, it's weeks to, to kind of get going as opposed to like months or years. Um, and a lot of that is just how, how much um, effort does the, the supplier want to expend in actually building the relationship. But, but, you know, the relationships do have a like a, a supplier agreement letter, so some commercial terms that we want to make sure that everybody agrees to, and those types of things. So you vet their capability. Um, is there a minimum threshold of product that they need to, to be offering to get going? Can I can I start with one SKU, for example? I'm guessing the answer is no. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that we have a minimum threshold. I think it, it would depend on like what the items were and those types of things, but certainly we have the most success with partners that give us the majority of their assortment versus people that say, hey, here's 200 items, let's see how this goes. Okay. Um, you know, so. Because I think I think those are a lot of the experiments that people are running today, the, mm -hmm. the 200 items. Let's, let's put 200 items on this or that uh, marketplace and see how it goes, right? Yep. Yeah, so someone uh, is paying you a compliment here. Uh, John says, Zorro seems to have generated a uniquely powerful loyalty among customers. What would you think accounts for this stickiness compared to com competitors? Um, so I think what we, I think what we do well is we take uh, a broad assortment of products and we're good at um, introducing that assortment of products to our customers. And then we're good at actually doing what we say we're gonna do from a fulfillment standpoint. I think everybody that's a supply chain professional uh, on the podcast or listening to it knows the challenges everybody's experiencing right now from a, a service level availability standpoint. Um, but I think we we deliver um, on the commitments that we make most you know most of the time. And if we have a, a challenge or a disruption, we tend to make it right for the customer. We one of our values that we say is that we aspire to be customer obsessed, and and so the word aspire there because like we should never get there. Um, it should always be this aspirational value that we're pursuing. And so we're definitely not perfect, but I think we, we are really trying to, to work to address that. Um, you know, an example would be have a great, a great customer service team. So, you know, it's pretty hard with some of the marketplaces, if something goes wrong to call someone and, and, and talk to a live human being. And we try and make that, you know, really easy so that you call within a few rings, someone answers the phone and helps the customer um, resolve whatever challenge they're having. 
Okay, that's it's great, man. I tell you, it's interesting. We've had like no fall off. Everybody's hung in here for this call the whole time, uh, Kevin. So there's a lot of uh, interest in what you're talking about. Um, and we have ten more, and we have ten more unanswered questions. Yeah, we got a bunch more unanswered questions. But I think uh, what we ought to do is, as Jonathan likes to say, leave them wanting more. So let's uh, give people your contact information. Uh, and I added Tracy's to the screen and wrap up. Is there anything else you want to share before we? Uh, we we uh, start wrapping up. Do we leave anything off the table that we should be discussing, Kevin? No, no. and I'd say thank you so much for for having me on. Um, you know, Tracy and the team do a wonderful job of of probably helping um, our distribution partners or potential partners better understand things than I do. Um, you know, they they live it and breathe it every day. Um, and so, so what I'd say is, you know, if you're curious, please, you know, reach out. We really appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and have a conversation about, you know, about Zorro, but also, um, you know, I, I think you did a nice job of kind of talking about some of the, like, just know what you're getting into if you're going to go into a marketplace. If you want to create your own, like, really think about what that means and the effort that you'll have to expend. And if you want to list with a marketplace, just really make sure you're thoughtful about, like, their motivations. So... Yeah, it's great. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, so for our podcast listeners who can't see the screen, uh, Kevin Wadick's email address is kevin.weadick at zorro.com. And then your uh, senior director of business development, I believe that's Tracy's title. Is that right? Um, uh, uh, senior director of business development. Got it. Okay. So uh, Tracy's email address is tracy dot b u e l o w at zorro.com and she's probably a great first contact for people who uh, distributors want to inquire on selling on your platform is that right yeah i i think if you start with tracy she can make sure she has a, a team of folks and she can find um, they tend to be you know focused in different uh product verticals and so she can right. get you to the right person right okay if you can't uh, if you can't remember that or you just want to reach out and get some more information feel free to reach out to either Jonathan or me, you can find us on distributionstrategy.com. We do have a couple of upcoming events I wanted to tell everyone about, about. On March 16th, we'll have the next episode of Wholesale Change, which is why losing customers costs more than you think. And Jonathan and I will use our long experience working with distributors to talk about uh, why it's so expensive and much more than just the cost of the sales you lost to have customers defect. And on March 9th coming up, we have our next uh, webinar, True Omnichannel Part One. That's brought to you by uh, Optimizely, Oracle, NetSuite, and Connexium. Wholesale, the next episode of Wholesale Change is brought to you by Oracle, NetSuite, and Covalo. Again, thank you to our sponsors. We couldn't do these shows without you. Thank you to Epicor who brought you today's content. Uh, Kevin, I hope you'll come back sometime. Uh, you'd be willing to come back sometime if we haven't made it too miserable for you here. No, it's great. I'm happy to come back. It was a lot of great. fun. Good. All right, Jonathan, great working with you today. Thanks to everyone for attending this episode of Wholesale Change. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye now.